Have at you, swine! Unhand me! Taste vengeance! Fiends! Stay your tongue! Young fool! Meet thy maker! To Valhalla! Say your prayer! Be gone! Well met! Switch Online didn't exactly light the world on fire when it launched, paywalling a previously free feature while tossing a meager selection of NES games at the suckers who bought in. Years later, it still offers no online improvements, but the library of games has expanded enough that $20 a year is reasonable for what you're getting. The expansion pack face-planted even harder, with just 9 N64 games rung through some of the worst emulation I've ever seen on modern hardware. It was rightfully mocked by most corners of the internet, but after more than a year of updates, it also deserves a second look. I don't do these videos just for my sick kicks. The goal is to add to the chorus asking for better services, and if Nintendo listens and makes positive changes then that should be encouraged, otherwise there's no point. Ocarina of Time was the low point for the original launch, but now most of its issues are fixed. The fog is restored, the Dark Link room works, and alpha textures seem to apply correctly now. That last one was a problem on every previous system, so the fact that it's finally been addressed is noteworthy. Latency has been improved but still falls behind my results from the Wii Virtual Console and Project 64. After subtracting the lag of my monitor, the average drop since launch was about 16 milliseconds, sometimes up to 25 in Zelda. Oddly, Sin and Punishment was the only game whose result didn't change at all. I never considered this to be a deal breaker, but it is good to see the rendering delay improve. Majora's Mask benefited from the updates and seems to avoid most of the issues that plagued Ocarina of Time. A few objects and textures display incorrectly, but nothing stands out as especially bad. Some alpha effects don't look bright enough, but it may have to do with seizure prevention rather than a bug. The same can be seen with Fire and Ocarina of Time, which was left unchanged when the other effects were fixed. There's a fix for the Giants cutscene that adds slowdown in order to keep the length equal to real hardware, which struggled to render this sequence. As far as I'm aware, this improvement isn't available on PC. There, the slowdown won't happen, so the scene ends before the music is finished. I've been using emulators for so long that I had forgotten this wasn't how it was to begin with. Both Zeldas now seem to be okay versions to play. The effect for Inviso and Yoshi's story was finally fixed with the GoldenEye update. It took over a year, but it's done. The glitchy lines in Star Fox cutscenes are also gone. For these games, it can be safely said that the emulation is the best Nintendo has ever offered. That should be a low bar to clear, but after the Wii U and Switch seem to just keep going downward, the turnaround here is nice to see. Not everything is patched, though. There are still pervasive tiling issues that cause seams and misalignments on most 2D assets. Even something as simple as the Dawn of screens in Majora show the split pretty clearly. A lot of effects still aren't being rendered correctly. New games can still show up with bugs as bad as the launch ones had, like Kirby getting permanently frozen after taking a single hit. There's still no controller pack support, and it's fairly surprising that they've left save systems and game features broken for this long. Data miners found references to the controller pack in the code right from the start, so I'm not sure what's holding it up. Even swapping the packs manually in the pop-up menu would be an acceptable solution. The controls are still a shit show. You're still expected to use ZR to mode shift the face buttons into C buttons, with no option to disable that and map the C buttons freely. Unless you like spinning in circles, left C is useless without right C, making it baffling that it gets the Y mapping in almost every game. What did they expect you to do with this button? The only way to get a decent scheme in some games is to buy the N64 pad, which is still chronically out of stock. The emulation may be overall better than the Wii U, but in this one regard it's a big step backward. The system level controls are not a solution to this. Each emulation app needs its own input menu, especially the N64 app. Users can't be expected to completely bork their controller for modern games every time they revisit a retro title. If Nintendo does want to rely on system level remapping, the bare minimum they need to do is make profiles faster to access or allow users to assign a profile to an app from its menu. The service is definitely improved, but it still isn't where it should be. It seems like rather than getting better at a core level, individual games have just benefited from a long drip feed of bug fixes. There isn't enough internal testing being done, and it's not until a game goes up that problems are found and brought to Nintendo's attention. From there, it's a matter of months or even years before they address them. The whole thing is still a low-priority project without enough resources behind it to justify the premium price. What does make an argument in the premium tier's favor is Goldeneye, which I never expected to see released again. It was rumored that the high price of the expansion pack was for the sake of getting difficult to license games on the service, and if so, then it's hard to argue with the results in this case. There are issues with this release, but first I'll say that it's fine. Nothing is as bad as what was seen in the first batch of games, and nothing stopped me from having a lot of fun replaying the entire thing. 
It was kind of heartwarming to see everyone online posting about playing Goldeneye again. Revisiting a simpler time where you could hose a fleeing Sean Bean down with a hail of Uzi fire and get nary a single reaction out of his cardboard box face. A new generation of players can get acquainted with the most unsatisfying weapon ever. A gun so bad not even triple wielding would save it. Clob up all you want, buddy. It's not gonna do shit. The game has aged terribly, but in a way that's a lot of fun to experience. The jank is loaded with potential for comedy. Characters go flying like rockets, losers get slapped, office furniture explodes, and innocent civilians run straight into tank treads and squash themselves into pudding. The developers knew what the game was and had fun with its absurdity while still taking the quality seriously. But underneath, the core game design unironically holds up. The objective-based difficulty system is still the best incentive to play on hard mode that I've ever seen a game offer, since you don't experience the full levels otherwise. The level designs run a full gamut from linear rail shooting to wide open free exploration. The developers experimented with every gameplay variation the hardware could handle and left few stones unturned. The multiplayer is really simple and quaint, but there are enough mode combinations to keep you entertained for hours. It's surprising how little the appeal of it has faded in the face of how ancient it feels nowadays. The fact that this game is accessible again is a great win for Nintendo, and nothing I say should undercut that. But the quality is a little disappointing. The controls will be a big obstacle for the newcomers that will finally get their hands on this game. The aim and fire buttons are not symmetrical due to ZR being used for the mode shift, and having to hold that shift in order to strafe is just awful. The N64 controller is the only way to perform strafe running with ease, which is important for speed running and cheat unlocks, but even that will still probably feel really weird to new players. The internet has settled on the best scheme being 1.2 solitaire, with the analog sticks and Z buttons reversed in the system settings. This gets you modern dual analog that feels great without unbalancing the difficulty, but again, the setup is complicated due to the lack of mapping within the app. There are some neat touches, like support for the game's built-in 16x9 that automatically reverts to 4.3 in menus to avoid a stretched UI. Mostly, though, the presentation is really ugly, with rampant aliasing and polygon seams. The Xbox version devs claimed that all their bugs are accurate to real hardware, and in some cases that seems true. The seams are in the original game, but they end up much more noticeable in these new versions. This is a general problem extending to other games on the service as well. Even when using low-level emulation, there are bad mappings and depth issues, but on Switch the glitches are easier to trigger and spot than they should be. Muzzle flashes are weaker than the original, but that's likely another safety measure and not a bug. Switch doesn't use N64-style MIP mapping, which could be considered an enhancement because the original LOD was really aggressive and blurry from any distance. The LOD seems partially broken, though. There's a model loading glitch that prevents destroyed objects from degrading. The model should darken with each shot and finally explode, leaving a scrap of debris behind. Instead, blown turrets are often fully intact, which creates confusion about which are safe and which are still active. The Statue Chopper has a similar bug that displays the intact model, spinning blades and all, at a distance even after it's exploded. I couldn't reproduce any of this in the Parallel plugin, so these bugs are new. The bad texture filtering leads to characters being cut off on one side and wrapped to the other, creating seams that aren't present in LLE. Parallel isn't the fairest comparison since it's beyond the capabilities of the Switch, but Glide N64 also avoids most texture issues. There's still a cutoff on some characters, but it's a marked improvement over Switch. Performance can be choppy, and the Caverns level specifically has some real frame rate issues. After playing, I noticed a lot of other reports of this online, so it seems to be consistently bad. Playing on Glide N64 is much smoother thanks to the unlocked frame rate allowing for 60 FPS, while Switch is capped to 30. And if you want to push the enhancements, 1964 offers a keyboard and mouse hack with standard WASD controls. Some people think it breaks the difficulty, but you can crank 007 mode as high as you need to compensate. Then there's the Xbox Live Arcade remaster, now seemingly confirmed to forever remain in Microsoft's trash bin. Emulating a patched up version of the leak gives you 60fps and dual analog by default, but it has a few remaining audio bugs. The graphics upgrade is a matter of taste. I think the update looks nice, but you lose Bean, you lose Brosnan, and you lose Boris. Ha <laughs> It can be toggled back to 64 with a button press at any time, though. The Wii remake isn't worth mentioning, since it's a different game. I still did it, and it wasted everyone's time. So a Switch is one of the weaker ways to play, and much better accuracy, performance, and enhancements can be had on PC. Again, it's fine, but they could and should have done better for such a high-profile release. But I'm forgetting online play. Switch Online lets you do the classic split-screen multiplayer with friends from around the world. And this is what that looks like.
It was hard to find anyone to play with because the feature is restricted to friends only, and no one I know has the expansion pack. The few people I did find on Discord couldn't connect well, and that led to a jank shitshow spectacular. I've seen videos of this before, but it's another thing to behold its glory in person. What could be a great asset to Switch is undone by the fact that it's so picky about whose internet will work, and you can't matchmake with a wider pool of strangers to find ones with acceptable pings. The setup is also confusing, and I had to check a guide to figure out that play while you wait is how you create a room and send invites. I'm not saying this mode has no value, or that you can't get fair connections with the right people, or even that it wasn't still fun at its absolute worst. I am saying that it's too unreliable and backwards to be the selling point that it should be. As always, there's competition here from the fan community, which rebuilt the multiplayer mode in Source Engine years ago. It might not have that authentic, low-poly charm, but it doesn't drop to 4 frames per second and screech robot atrocities into your ears when a friend connects, so it's a trade-off. Complaints aside, I appreciate that Nintendo seems to have tried here. Negotiating this release was not an easy thing to do, and I want to say that it bodes well for getting more games on the service. Except the NES and SNES apps haven't been updated since July 2022. Those platforms have been mostly wrapped up for a while now. Regardless, there's a lot to play for $20, and the sudden addition of the Game Boy bolsters this tier as a pretty fair deal. The expansion pack is still struggling. Genesis games continue to trickle in, but that only has so much appeal when you can buy and own a bundle with many more games on Steam for half the price of renting them on Switch. Game Boy Advance certainly moves things in the right direction, but the starting library is extremely small. There is no point in doing the drip feed thing anymore, just upload the ROMs. The emulation at least looks really sharp so far, with the scanline filter that's much better than the blur option from Wii U. Let's see if these additions are enough to reverse the big downward staircase graph of releases. Excluding the SP remixes, Switch currently has 191 games. Including all announced games, the number climbs to 206. It's possible that Switch could overtake the Wii U's 311 before the generation is over. That system was an abject flop, yet still added most of its systems within the first three years. The Switch is one of their most profitable ever, and is only receiving these platforms at year 6. Their waning enthusiasm for these libraries is plain to see. The upside is that they've at least exceeded the Wii and Wii U counts for N64, but there isn't much track left ahead. Aside from Perfect Dark and Smash Brothers, there aren't many heavy hitters to boost the pack with. I still don't think this is worth $50, and the only thing that could get me there is a GameCube app. Knowing Nintendo, though, they would probably make that an $80 tier. There is some value on the DLC side, and if you happen to own Mario Kart, Animal Crossing, and Splatoon 2, then you could save $20 by using the expansion pack rather than buying all DLC outright. But that's assuming you play everything within one year. Spread across even just two years, you're now paying $30 more to own absolutely nothing. The value completely evaporates, and the fact that new DLC already isn't being included makes this deal even weaker. It's not too exciting next to something like Game Pass, which not only has many more titles but newer AAA ones, and gives you a cheaper path to ownership if you want to keep something. The price is higher, but the value is much easier to see. There's also the creeping effect of more monetization in games themselves as services like this gain traction. The kind of items that should be free unlocks get shifted behind paywalls, with even the already paywalled online icons getting a double paywalled N64 batch. Nintendo also likes to force timed exclusivity, so that any lapse in membership results in missed content. So it still sucks, but far less than it did at launch. It's not a slap in the face anymore. They've reached that adequate level of quality for most games, where it's about as good as you can expect a commercial emulator to be. The goalposts have moved though, and the old adequate doesn't look so adequate now. I've droned on about this so many times that I'm bored of it, but fans are doing better with retro games now than they ever have. Even lowly N64 emulators are getting a ray tracing plugin with 60 FPS interpolation, and a long list of games are in the process of being decompiled and ported to PC. This is a relatively new development, but the progress has been rapid. A link to the past just went public as I was editing this. Perfect Dark is decompiled and GoldenEye is in progress, meaning that ports with real online play and new content aren't far off. Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time have been out for a while, both offering dramatic enhancements to the performance and controls. This is the next evolution of game preservation, radically improving quality and ease of use by leaving emulators and their limitations behind. Meanwhile, Nintendo is still fucking around trying to get basic emulation right, backsliding with every system like Sisyphus forever pushing a boulder uphill only to drop it. You can have a discussion about whether it's fair to hold them to the standards fans are setting. No one is expecting or asking for transistor-accurate apps with ray tracing and high frame rates. 
The point of this video is that all that great fan software does exist, and comparisons don't flatter a mediocre, buggy, vanilla emulation service like this. Switch Online rakes in money regardless, but I do wonder how many more generations they can go without doing the minimum, which to me should now be Glide N64 level accuracy. Maybe I'm just an old-fashioned hoe who doesn't know shit about anything, but that's my one-year update on the service. Nintendo sincerely deserves credit for improving, and they took a few good steps forward. But in the same time frame that fan developers leapt by miles, so the gap only widened. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again in 2028, when Switch 2 gets a version of Ocarina of Time that's nothing but fog. James Bond. James Bond. James Bond will kill you. He gives no fucks. James Bond will love you. He is a total stud in bed. Here comes James Bond, he's fucking coming to kill you. Here comes James Bond, he's fucking coming to shag you. The man with the gun, the mysterious look in his eyes. If you don't know who he is, then he is James Bond. He's James Bond.